A very good morning to you. Welcome to KTM Mid Morning. My name is Koi. Now, preservation of historical buildings and sites involves maintaining the integrity of the place through protection and restoration using both old and new materials. Now, historical establishments serve as reminders of the past. Understanding the past, having reminders of the past, even just in architecture, will allow people to understand where they are and where they're headed. Now, when people understand what the community has gone through and have visual reminders of their past, then they can feel more connected to a place. Now, a great example of architecture that has survived the ravages of over 80 years is located in the heart of Kenya's tea and coffee growing highlands. Check it out. The Outspan Hotel is set in a well tented tropical garden in the town of Nyeri in the Abadares. To outspan means to unyoke one's weary oxen at the end of a day's journey. According to history, Lord Baden Powell, who in 1920 was proclaimed Chief Scout of the World, recognized the tranquility and beauty of the Outspan and chose to outspan at the hotel with his wife for the last three years of his life. Speaking to Esther Mwangi of Abadea Safari Travels, a company which manages the Outspan Hotel, we learn some more history about this colonial style hotel. The Outspan is a hotel that is managed by Badea Safari Hotel, which manages three properties. That is the Outspan, Treetops, and Shimba. Outspan was built in 1927 uh, by Shabrook Walker, who settled here very a very long time ago, while Kenya was still under colonial rule. And what he did is, after fighting in the First World War for the British Army, he came and settled here. He bought land here. Yeah, the Chania River, which is not far from here, it passes through here, and he decided to build a hotel. From the exterior of the hotel, it is not easy to believe that it has stood direct for over 80 years. As you've seen from the architecture of the place, it's more of a colonial style building, especially what remains of the old outspan, because it was built in that time when colonialists who had settled here. You can see a lot of that style, the, the colonial style, the, even our rooms, our restaurant especially. Outspan Hotel provides a wholesome experience of business, leisure and adventure. Outspan has a lot to offer as a hotel. Uh, we have accommodation, we have 45 rooms in total. We have three categories of rooms. We have standard, deluxe and cottages. We also do have a lot to offer in terms of food and beverage. We two outlets, both bar and restaurant. Once you get inside, you're immediately welcomed by two large doors which lead to the reception. The receptionist station is made of smooth wood which is a rich dark brown. Moving from the reception and ready to check in into your room, you're met by pearl white walls complemented with dark brown tiles on the floor. This gives out a great contrast in the interior. One great way to improve the aesthetic of any room is the addition of live plants. Many business meetings and conferences are held at the Outspan and for that reason, a business center is not only a luxury but a necessity as well. You are quickly drawn to the chandelier which is simple in design yet it stands out. A better peek inside the business center reveals several couches in red covers and printed fabric. The addition of the green and red print couches breaks the monotony in the room. The corridor along the business center is spacious and has seats located next to power sources for those who want to use their gadgets in a more private setting. Paintings hang on the wall at the ambience in the room. The lampshades arranged along one side in a linear manner bring the whole look together. A peek into the standard room reveals a big double bed which is covered with a pink bed cover with white pillowcases which gives the bed a welcoming look for an exhausted traveller. The lights displayed by both sides of the bed are uniquely fixed on the wall. To add as a reminder of the fauna that can be found in the nearby park is a picture such as this one. The rooms are interconnected which is very ideal for families especially those travelling with kids. The rooms are very spacious and the floors made of wood. A chandelier always provides for a great look in any room. 
What is great about the chandeliers at Outspan is the use of lampshades instead of crystals. A traditional fireplace is set in place for those extra cold nights. The room also has a small lounge area with a wooden coffee table and two armchairs which are covered with a detailed pink fabric. The wall in this area is also in a pink hue which complements the seats. The pink curtains with white blinds tie the overall look. The balcony is a great addition for those who like to sit outside and enjoy the view. As is evident, the view from this balcony is simply breathtaking with the evergreen lawn and the abundance of flora. Apart from the elaborate accommodation, another major attraction of staying at the hotel is its proximity to one of Kenya's biggest forest lands. We are very close to Abadea National Park which is uh, very rich in terms of flora and fauna. So we do organize activities from here. We do game drives. We do cultural visits within the area because there are a lot of places that have historical meaning in this area. We also do activities such as nature walks. We do have a nature walk activity here. The other thing that is of historic importance is Baden Powell, the founder of the scouting movement, he lived his last days in this place and where he lived, his house where he lived, we converted it into a museum called Park Stew Museum and it's a place where you can go see uh, some remains of what he left behind after he passed away and then it's also a place where scouts come visiting every year and they leave their memorabilia so there's a lot to learn also there. The Abadea National Park covers a vast area and forms part of the Abadea mountain range. Not only is the Abadea home to a massive variety of flora, but also has a number of fauna sighted as well. Those lucky enough can catch a glimpse of the vast number of wildlife found at the Abadeas. The National Park enables the Outspan Hotel to attract foreign visitors as well as local ones. At Outspan, uh, I would like to say that majority of our guests are actually Kenyan guests and that is because we do a lot of conferencing and corporate uh, accommodation that they are the majority of our market like I said we do have conferencing facilities so corporate conferencing forms the majority of our market here but we are also growing our international market in terms of agents we have agents who we have contracts with and they bring us business we have been working on a strategic plan and basically that involves first of all increasing our accommodation capacity because we have realized that sometimes we do um, miss out on business based on our capacity we have 45 rooms and we hope in the next few years to increase to about 60 rooms so that is the direction that we're taking and also as we increase our room capacity we want also to build a state-of-the-art conferencing center which will be able to support our conferencing business better. The Outspan Hotel is about 160 kilometers from Nairobi and two kilometers from Nyeri town. It's about two and a half hours drive from Nairobi to here and with the building of the thicker superhighway it's even easier to get here so one doesn't have to travel long hours and apart from that someone can also fly we have an airstrip in Moiga where private planes or chartered planes can land. The Outspan Hotel is a fully loaded package of business, leisure and adventure. Stay tuned for Right at Home, which is coming up next. By the time you're signing a contract, there are some approvals you need to have. You need to have uh, perused because at the time of sending a contract there are some documents showing the dimensions like the approved plans showing the dimensions of a house 
the, the, then there's a something called a sample house. Sometimes when you're purchasing, there's usually the sample unit. So if these particulars have already been have already been put in the sale agreement, and they are quite clear that you're purchasing as a, as per the inspected. Uh, approved drawings or probably you're purchasing as seen on the show house then with that you have every right to sue you have every right to demand for quality of, service, of, of what you had demanded of the product that you had demanded but most of the time you'll find even in even a brochures particulars are never warranted and that is why you need to be very careful because most of the time what they'll just give you a specifications it's going to be a two-bedroom house a three-bedroom house wooden flooring this is this this is it but now at the end of the day you don't get to get to know what are the actual dimensions of a house and these things actually change depending on what is going to be approved sometimes you may want sometimes they may say they want to build a house of this dimensions but what is approved is something lesser so as at the time of purchasing you need to have inspected and that's why you need an advocate you need to have inspected the approved drawings because with the approved drawings or the actual drawings you'll be able to look at them and see the actual dimensions of what it is that you're purchasing and that now will be able to put you in a picture of what it is that you're purchasing it's called an assignment and um, it varies from, from, from developers or rather from vendors. There are vendors who allow for assignment, where one, one can come in and at uh, somewhere along the transaction you feel like you want to sell, when especially the prices have gone high. And with the consent of the vendor, you can assign the property to somebody else. But now that the person coming in will now take that property with the same terms. You took you took with for example if you are paying in a monthly installments or you are paying on uh, by monthly or whatever b b mode of payment it is that you are paying so whatever rights and obligations that you were able to negotiate at the beginning of the contract you will be handing them down to the new purchaser so it's called an assignment and it definitely has to be with consent of the vendor because some vendors do not allow you to assign the property or sell the property until you yourself have finalized making the payments so some will demand first finalize on the payments. For example, if you are buying a house for five million and you found a purchaser who's willing to sell it, uh, I mean to buy it for, 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 for seven million, now the vendor will say, no, pay me my five, five million first. When you find an instance, the new purchaser can even decide, fine, let me help you pay uh, offset or rather finalize with your balance. And then now I come in and become the new, new purchaser. But some vendors are very flexible. They will say, fine, you found somebody else, as long as they are willing to take over your burdens take over from where you left. So what will happen is that the new, the new purchaser will pay you off what you had paid together with the profits that you've made on top and then they will be left now with the vendor and complete the transactions with the terms that you had entered into. So they'll be more or less just taking over from where you'd left off. Now, that is the biggest quagmire purchasers are actually facing, especially when it comes to, to apartments where you're, you're sharing common facilities and you have a management company. Okay, now what happens is that ordinarily where every transaction, okay, ordinarily what's supposed to happen is that every year the management company is supposed to take care of the service charge, is supposed to take care of the um, uh, uh, land rent and land rates of that property and clear it annually consistently but what would happen ordinarily is that if you want now to dispose of your of your property you will have now to go to the management company now you know the management companies are now the common owners of these apartments so you'll have now to go to them to, re to request them to give you their consent also because they need to give their consent and also uh, have cleared the land rents and the land rates and give you the clearance certificates so it's it, I call it a quagmire because at the end of the day you find that you're not detached you're not free to dispose of your property as you may want to or, or charge it because at the end of the day you will still need the consent and approval of the management company and sometimes you find that there are delays Sometimes you may want to dispose of your property and find that maybe they have a crude land rent and or, or is that a oi and you find that purchasers at the end of the day or a, a person who's selling decide to you know to, to run the loss to pay it off and have it signed because at that time you find maybe the management company was not running as appropriately as should it should have been because ordinarily it should it should maintain and ensure that all these payments are paid timely so that should there be a transaction or anybody wanting to transact with the property that they don't now get a hitch at the, at the end of the day when you find now you want to transfer and there are some uh, payments that are due and owing. Yeah. 
so I call it a quagmire, but it is doable. And if we find that's a management company that actually, uh, it's, it's smooth running in some places, but not always. We're still receiving Christmas messages for your loved ones, so keep them coming in. And let's take a short music break up next. Let's hear from our speaker on Eve Sisters that's coming up next. Like I said, I've been working for about 17 years now. I started working when I was about uh, 17 years old. The reason why I started working is because my mother didn't like people being lazy. And right next to our house in Kilaleshwa, there were all these people who used to walk up in and out. Uh, some of them had crutches, some of them, you know, uh, you know, not physically disabled, but many of them were. And so it was a bit peculiar. They were always walking up and down. And one day she said to me, why don't you go and find out what goes on there? Instead of sitting here and doing absolutely nothing, being a bum. And so I went in and I found that they were watching, everyone was watching TV and listening to the radio and actually logging down certain information. And I thought, this is not bad. I can actually tell my parents I'm going to work, but I'm just going to be watching TV. So that's not a bad thing to do. And so I actually then met a gentleman and asked him to perhaps, you know, uh, assist me, uh, show my mother that I was a serious young girl and give me anything to do. The man's name was Roger Stedman. And so he did give me a job uh, and I started working there um, as an intern, listening to the radio, logging down advertisements, um, and what I, I, I actually, you know, learned from my experiences with that, you know, uh, company is that I was actually a very good marketer. I liked marketing. And so I did everything to learn about every single sector at Stedman. The market research sector, uh, the media monitoring sector, the training division that was there. And, you know, I just immersed myself into it. I'd go and sit with everybody and learn everything I could about what they were doing, from the little guy to the, the very important guy. Today, I still think that when I get angry, I say, what would that guy do? Much as he's my biggest competitor right now. I still say that. And I think as I go by, you will see what these things help you do in terms of breaking that glass ceiling. Because indeed, what he then became was an excellent mentor. Um, having said that, I finished college, went to college, finished college, uh, graduated. And luckily for me, I just went back to the same place and I said, I'm ready. You need to give me a job. I need a job now. Um, and uh, he said, well, you need to apply. And I was very shocked because I thought, well, you know me, etc., etc. And so I went and started writing this very long letter. There was no Google. started writing this very long letter as to why I thought I would be the best person to go and work for them. And can you imagine what I thought I should be? I was applying for general manager. <laughs> And so he called me and he, you know, he called and he said, why did you come and see me? And I went, I wore this suit. It was slightly oversized because I didn't have any suits. So I went into my mom's closet and looked for anything that I thought could fit. And I went to see him and, um, you know, sat with him. And he asked me, why do you want to be general manager? And I said, uh, you know, I always thought, and my parents have always told me, that I, if I put my mind to it, I could do anything. And I want to be the best there can be in anything that I can do, or anything I put my mind to do. In this case, I want to run this company. I think I was maybe 23. And so he looked at me and thought, and said, you will start off as a 
TV and radio monitor. So I started off as a TV and radio monitor, which was okay. I did it with pride. And I did that for about six months, and then I said, not on. I need to do something else. And so I started agitating with my supervisor, give me more, can I do more work, give me something else to do, etc. And he asked me to prove myself. And so because I had actually been spending a lot of time with everybody else, I then found it very easy to actually, you know, move up in the ranks uh, from TV monitor to supervisor in the monitoring department to whatever else it was. So the long and short of it was that after um, about three years, I actually was given the job as general manager. I wanted to prove myself so badly. I was the last person to leave the office. I was the first person to get in. I was the one who was always ready to go and see a client. I was the one who would go to the client who was, you know, that nightmare. The one who would insult you and you go to the bathroom and you actually feel so bad about yourself because they've made you feel so small. But it taught me so much. It taught me endurance. It taught me that if you want to achieve anything and you put your mind to it, you actually can. And so for, uh, at the age of 26, I was managing director of what is now Ipsos. Um, I stayed there for nine years. And after nine years, we were becoming like two, what do they say, nidume wawili? My boss and I just couldn't get along anymore. And it happens. And that is where you sometimes hear the you know, phrase glass ceiling. It was his company, not mine. But I'd gotten to the point where I thought it was mine. And so in the boardrooms, we were constantly squabbling disagreeing over issues. Should the wall be green? No, it should be blue. Why should it be blue? Because I like blue. But I think it should be green because green is our official color. But blue is calming and what, you know, little, little things. And it happened for about two years. For two years, I was battling. I'd become managing director. I kept asking myself, what else am I going to do here? I'm only 30 years old. I'll go to work at 10 o'clock, because I was the boss, I would you know, leave at three. Um, and, and then I said to myself, this is not healthy. It's not helping me very much. What should I do? I should think outside the box. I should realize that there is nothing that limits me from achieving what I want to achieve. And so I, I, I registered for a course, master's course, which was, I think, one of the best things I ever did. Because in that course, I learned so much about business. Uh, and whilst I was running a business, it actually just you know, cemented all the knowledge that I had on what business administration and management was all about. But my most favorite you know, part of that course was entrepreneurship. Because it taught me that I was actually an intrapreneur. I was running someone else's business, and I was not an entrepreneur running my own shop. And one of the teachers who was teaching us actually posed the question, what do you want to be now that you're in this class? Do you want to be an intrapreneur? Do you want to be an entrepreneur? In other words, do you want to go out there and hustle? Do you want to take the risks? Do you want to have sleepless nights? Do you want to go to people's offices and they look at you and think you're crazy? And I thought, I think I want that. And so after finishing the course, I took a sabbatical. I went off to the US um, for about six months. And when I was in the US, I looked at toys are us, babies are us, and all those things, retail outlets, thinking that I could come back and start a Toys R Us, or a Babies R Us, or a hairdresser's shop, because I didn't want anything to do with research or monitoring. I was tired. And when I came back, I sat with a friend of mine at uh, uh, the Serena Hotel. 
And this guy sat with me and he said, Angela, what's your plan? And I said, well, I'm actually going to leave my job. You're the first person I'm telling. And uh, the other thing I haven't told you is at that point I was about four months pregnant. Yeah? So he looked at me and he said, I think it's the hormones. <laughs> it's okay, it's going to go away. Don't worry. And so um, I told him, I don't think so. I don't think it's the hormones. I, I've not been happy for about two years in my job. I've reached that point where I just don't want to get up. I, I've not wanted to go to work for a long time. It has nothing to do with my pregnancy. In fact, my pregnancy made me very nonchalant. I was the best boss then. You come to work late, I say, it's okay. <laughs> and they kept saying, we wish you could be pregnant forever. <laughs> She's so curly. And so um, after, you know, uh, discussions with various people, consultations with various people, I realized to myself that Babies R Us were probably not, was not probably the thing I was going to be doing. Toys R Us was not me. I needed just to get back into my element and do what I did best and do it for myself as an entrepreneur. And so month nine, which was um, uh, April 2004, I was sitting with my boss one day and we were discussing, I think, expansion into some country. I can't even remember because with pregnancy, for those of us who have been pregnant, comes amnesia, isn't it? You forget things so quickly. So I can't even remember. I couldn't even remember by the time I walked out that door which country exactly we were supposed to be you know, expanding to. But in any case, I sat there and all I could see was his mouth. And I said, this is the day. Today is my last day here. I've spent 10 years here, nine officially, one as an intern, I'm gone. And so, I went to check because I wanted to pack my nine years of stuff, but it's amazing how we, our intuition works with us. I had been packing for two years. I had like two folders to carry. I had no box and my laptop. That was it. And so I left. I went home. I told my husband then, I've quit. He said, you've done what? I said, I've quit. Quit what? It could be quitting anything. Quitting is relative. I said, <laughs> it could be quitting the marriage, exactly. Said, quitting is, you know, relative. I say, I quit my job. I'm not going back. He says, now, when we're getting a new baby, we're moving to a new house. Are you crazy? And I say, I don't think I've been ever so sane in my whole life. This is the first time I think I'm making a decision that I am sure about. I don't care about that big car. I don't want that big office. I'm not going back. And so I wrote a letter, my resignation letter. I gave it to him, please drop it off. And he dropped it, dropped it off and uh, my boss then called him and said, it's okay. You know, I know women. <laughs> She's gonna come round. It's just the pregnancy hormones working on her, so just let her be. Yeah, I think let's give her until after. But if I can bet you because she likes working so much, she's probably going to be back in the office in another week. Okay. And so he didn't say anything to me. Week one, I'm just sitting, lazing, you know, trying to get things done. I have no interest in hearing anything about the office. They call me, I say, check here, go to that place. I'd already put everything in place so well, intuitively, that all the managers knew what to do. And so, eventually, it dawned on everybody that I wasn't going back. I had finally moved on. I think it was the best decision I made, because it made me realize that for two years, I was allowing myself to believe that that glass ceiling existed. And having left, I think many people thought she's given up. 
She's actually thinking that the glass ceiling exists. She doesn't want to go to this new country that they're going to be going to. The organization is becoming too big. They're, they're going to have boards. She doesn't want to sit in a board, etc., etc., etc. Having said that, I wasn't very sure what it is I wanted to do yet. I just knew it wasn't going to be Toys R Us or Babies R Us or a salon. It wasn't going to be any of those things. And after three months of sitting at home with my lovely son, I said, it's time. I need to get up and move. And I then again had many consultative meetings with various people who said to me, you're bloody good at what you do. And I think this is one thing that we women must acknowledge, that that praise, that appreciation of what our strengths are hardly ever comes from us. It comes from other people. If you talk to a very good friend of yours, they're more likely to tell you how many strengths you have. I will tell Mwishimiwa I think she is extremely knowledgeable. I think she's doing very well for young women in Kenya. I, anytime I see her on TV, I know she's going to represent her, her side well because she's prepared. I will tell Jenny, who was standing here, my listening skills are not good, and I listened to you today. You're captive in the way you speak, you are funny, and you actually bring the point home. And I think we always have to ask ourselves these things. So I sat with a friend, and he said to me, Angela, just do what you do best. Just go and do it for yourself. It's what you know, and people know you for it. And so obviously for me, there was also a lot of stress and strain from the home front. Immense stress. I remember at one point I was sitting at home and my father-in-law then came and said to me, how can you leave a job that good? What is wrong with you? Do you really think that you can now go out there and start a business as big as the one that you were working for? And I think that was the best thing he ever said to me. Because we as women, when you doubt us, we show you. When you doubt our abilities, we will tell you, yes, we can. And so that was the first wake-up call. I said, really, these people don't really understand what I'm made of. I'm made of tough stuff. I've built this thing from nothing. It was called somebody's name. It's now called something else. We're in four different countries. Why can't he see that I did this? And I'm going to do it for myself now. Christmas is just a week away and we want to help you let your loved ones know that you are thinking about them. Send your pictures, your Christmas messages and your comments to midmorning at standardmedia.co.ke and also comment on the discussions posted in KTM Midmorning on Facebook as well. While you're there, don't forget to like the page. That's all we have for you today. Have yourselves a wonderful day. See you tomorrow.